Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. And hopefully today I uh, can pass on some of the information that I've learned over the last, uh, you know, 10 years specifically, but my lifetime of, of studying this game and trying to figure out how to help make players better. And I hope you guys enjoy. So this game we love, right? Baseball is such a game of tradition, right? Like it gets passed down from generation to generation. And ultimately, that makes us all super passionate about it, right? Like, passion is what led us here, right? Think about Augie Garrido, right? Giving that speech, Pete Rose diving headfirst into every base, a million miles an hour, right? We're all super passionate. And the interesting thing about passion, right? The, the word, the root, pati from Latin, actually means to suffer greatly for what we love. And I think we, we all know what that's like as baseball coaches, especially recently, right? Like we've hit this information age. The game has, has changed, right? People have changed, right? Uh, this information age we've hit uh, it is pretty amazing. We're getting it thrown at us from every which way, right? We have players getting stuff from social media. We're getting stuff from social media. Tons of things being thrown at us. We have no idea who to listen to, what's right, what's wrong. We got all this technology, right, coming out every single day, every year, we have new forms of technology coming out. We have to figure out, you know, how to use it, what it means. We have, you know, StatCast, Baseball Savant, uh, fan graphs, that there's more information than ever before, but there's actually less truth. I love data, right? Like, I love data analysis and sports data analytics, but I think there are cases in which we become too slavish to it. And so there's this, this almost desire to validate everything by data, and it's backward. It's making something important because we can measure it. It's not measuring it because it's important. Now think about the power of that statement for a second. We're, we're making things important because we're, we can measure them. We're not measuring them because they're important. This data revolution is, is amazing. It's created amazing opportunities, amazing things, and it's necessary for us to continue to grow the game and get better at our jobs. But it's also created a lot of problems and it's created a lot of confusion for people. The reality is that most coaches, like, there's tremendous constraints placed on us, right? Like facility limitations, time constraints, budgets, staff restrictions. And this has created a ridiculous learning curve for coaches and for players everywhere, right? And ultimately, there's really just no school for coaches, right? There's no place that we can go and really learn how to do our jobs. It's up to us to figure that out on our own journeys. So today, I'm gonna to kind of walk you guys through this, these three presentations uh, through some of my journey and some of our journey at 108 and the things that we've learned uh, you know, over the last 10 years. Um, so initially, uh, I'm, all right, I'm, I'm from Long Island, New York, right? That's where I grew up. And you know, I grew up in a military household. I grew up in my grandparents' house. My grandfather was a retired lieutenant colonel in the military and he was an attorney, right? And information, was, was really important to him, knowledge, right? Being logical, uh, being passionate. These were things that were really important to him and were really instilled in me. And I wanna share the three most important lessons that I've ever learned in my entire life, okay? One, your success in life will be based on how much information you've been able to acquire and how effectively you can communicate it to other people, right? Think about the power of that statement, right? Information is nice to have, but if you can't effectively communicate it, it's really worthless, and no matter, what, no matter what job you have, but especially for us as coaches and educators, how we understand the swing or hitting doesn't matter. It matters if we can communicate that to, to, to the player, right, to other people. Number two, you can get the same education at Harvard, in a public library that you can at Harvard if you read the right books. Now, that statement has become even more powerful for me personally uh, over the last 10 years, right? Information is just flooding their stuff everywhere. If you dig, there is a tremendous amount of gold that you can find, okay? Number three, the average person, if you look at their daily life, they're gonna spend about eight hours sleeping, eight hours at work, and eight hours of their own free time every single day. If you extrapolate that over a lifetime, right, we're looking at a third of your life sleeping, a third working, and a third of your own free time. But I think we could all agree the time that we're sleeping really doesn't count, right? We're not awake to actually experience it. So essentially half of your awake life is your work and half is, is your free time. Now, if you don't like showing up to your job every day, if you don't like your work, half of your life is not gonna be very fulfilling. It's gonna be pretty miserable. And on top of that, if you're only working eight hours a day and that's the only time you're putting into your craft, 
you're probably going to fail. You're, you're, not, you're not likely to be very successful, right? You got to be willing to do that extra work. So, you know, you got to figure out what you love, right? And, and you know, for me, that, that, was, that was huge in my household, right? What do you love to do? What do you want to learn about? And for me, it was three things. It was fishing. I love fishing. I love hunting big game fish. It was food. My family actually owns an Italian uh, specialty store and a chain of them back east. And I grew up working there. I started when I was 12, right? So I became a huge foodie. I love to cook and especially love Italian food. Three, baseball. Man, I have always, ever since I can remember, I've been obsessed with the game. Like I was a kid that was playing baseball video games, watching baseball movies, uh, collecting baseball cards, anything and everything you could think of, right? And to the point where like even my twin daughters, one of them, her middle name is after the stadium I grew up going to games at. And the other one is named after my favorite player of all time. Even the stupid mustache I have is a throwback to the first set of baseball cards ever printed, right? So growing up, I was blessed with the opportunity to go to an academy for like 10 years. And man, like the impact that that had on my life, right? New York Tech Baseball Academy, unbelievable, right? It was like the best experience of my life. It, it taught me everything I could ever want to know about the game and especially uh, just to really love it, right? And to be passionate about it. But you know, I came up in a really old school environment, right? It was all that conventional wisdom that gets passed down generation to generation. And when I first started coaching, that's what I was doing. I was passionately professing all of that information that I had worked so hard to acquire. And even though it was old school, the truth is, like, I, I thought I was a pretty good coach, right? I took all, I was doing travel ball, I was coaching college summer ball, we won games, guys got better, we had tangible results, uh, you know, like, I felt like I was a pretty good coach until 2010 when I went to my first ABCA convention. And I met Don Slott from Right View Pro and I listened to Ron Woolforth and Brent Strom speak at that ABCA convention. I got hit in the head like a, with a bag of bricks, okay? That's where I learned about Bernstein's scientific principle for the first time, that the human body will organize itself based on the, uh, the intent of the, the activity, right? So Bernstein Scientific Principle, all of it changed my life. I mean, we went back and we were self-organization, swinging as hard as we can, throwing as hard as we can. And that's not something I had ever taught before, right? All that was new, okay? Uh, then, then Derek Jeter, right? Growing up in New York, even as a Mets fan, like I watched Derek Jeter chopping these swings all the time in, in the on-deck circle. And I got to learn at my academy from his hitting coach with the Yankees, Rick Down, who taught us about swinging down and the importance of it. And then I saw Jeter when I met Don Slott and he showed me Derek Jeter's never swung down in his whole life. Every ball he's ever hit, his barrel travels up. And I was like, oh my God, right? After all that, I went back and I just went berserk. I got a slow motion system. I was studying anybody and anything and everything I could find. For me, being so passionate about education and information and growing up having really put time into studying the game and then to, to learn that these things that I think are so true that I would have, you know, bet anything I had on are incorrect. Like that, that profoundly changed me and changed my approach. So I went hunting, right? I studied Wallenrock and Lada and, you know, everything hitting I could find. I, I went and studied pitching. I was looking at Texas Baseball Ranch. I was NPA certified. I was doing driveline stuff back in 2011, 2012, uh, or at least starting to, you know, study it at that time. I was doing research on everything I could find, ASMI, uh, Alan Nathans, where anything I could find I was researching, right? And what happened? Well, we got results. We definitely, we got some results. And you know, that I, I became very brazen in that, right? Because it was all this information I thought I knew. And then I learned all this stuff and then guys were starting to get better. And I was against the swing down thing. Everybody's got to swing up, right? And uh, you know, with, even with those results, like you have to realize, and this is something I've learned over my time doing this, like you, you have to be objective. And I've gotten more and more objective over the time because you know, it's a Dunning-Kruger. You, you keep learning that you don't know it all, right? And not everybody was getting results, right? At least not that counted. Not everybody was getting results that translated to 7 o'clock when the lights turn on. Uh, so I had to figure out why. Why? How come these things I'm doing aren't working? Why isn't it working, right? So what are we missing? 
And that was a big purpose behind 108. You know, when I opened up 108 in 2014, that was the goal, right? I put away travel ball, put away classes, lessons, all that other stuff. And all I wanted to do, I got rid of everything else I was doing, and I put all of my eggs in the player development basket, right? Because I felt like there was so much more. And man, what we hired, I hired the head sports scientist from the Washington Nationals to come work for me for two years. Uh, I, I hired uh, guys from Cressy Sports Performance come work for me. I mean, I went all in. I mean, we're talking, you know, a ridiculous overhead, right? Mostly spent on like coaches, bringing them in from all over the country, uh, having houses for them to stay in, just, just so we could push this thing forward and, and really figure it out. We went all in. Uh, we partnered with the biomechanics lab, met a brilliant biomechanist, partnered with a lab so we could really do some real research and figure out like what's true. I want truth. I don't want conventional wisdom anymore. I want truth, right? Now, speaking of that, I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson say this, and this is one of the most powerful statements I've ever heard. Wisdom is the distilled essence of knowledge once you've forgotten all the details, right? Knowledge, information is one thing. Wisdom is knowing how to use it and knowing what to pay attention to. And I think that we often get myopic, right, in this game. We often uh, look too fine. Right? We end up taking the sand and the pebbles and sticking those in the jar first instead of realizing what the big rocks are and putting those in first. So I want to start out by taking a really high-level, 10,000-foot view of this whole thing. What is player development? What is it? Well, in the context for this discussion, it's, it's hidden. Right? So it's getting guys to hit the ball harder. Getting guys to be able to ball strike more consistently than they have and guys being healthy and be able to, to go out and do it all the time. Now, all of these things are metrics. These are all data points, right? Data points that can be collected to tell us if we're actually doing our job. But the most important data point that exists is what happens at seven o'clock, boys and girls. It has to transfer. If it doesn't transfer, it doesn't matter. Now, when we look at this particular player, we look at this, you know, these numbers, these are statistics over the course of a season. If you look at this player's 2018 season, he had 263 in college with three home runs and nine doubles. That's not very good. It's not awful, but it's not very good enough for a college player. Uh, well, the next year, right, in his first 16 games, he was batting 245 with two doubles and one home run. And then he came in and we made a specific swing change. And after that swing change, uh, he had 406 with 14 doubles, 13 jacks, and ended up getting drafted right, by a professional organization that year. Literally changed his life. Player development is a real thing, and the best at it are, are doing some really specific things, okay? And there's a secret sauce to it, right? What is that secret sauce? Well, that's what we're here to talk about today, because the real magic, boys and girls, is in the movement. It's in the movement, because every single thing, movement is everything. Every single thing that happens to the ball, when we hit it or when we throw it, is a result of how someone moved. The movement literally creates all of the data, right? And our job in player development is to take chicken crap, right? Bad data, bad movement, and turn it into chicken salad. That's our job. Our job is to take a guy that looks like this when he squats and teach him how to look like that and make his body look like that. Now let's think about squatting for a second. Let's say you had an awful squat pattern, for instance, and I think we could all agree this one is terrible, right? Say you got lower back pain, you go see the doctor, and it says take three months off, right, from squatting, get with this PT for rehab, and monitor your workload, and you're gonna be fine. And you do your exercises, and everything's great, time to start squatting again. But you go back to doing it the same way you did it before. If you don't change the pattern, you can't fix the problem, okay? If you don't change the pattern, you can't fix the problem. And as a movement coach, we're trying to help our athletes solve movement problems. That's our job. We have to be problem solvers, right? And you can use all the, uh, and this goes on for pitching too, you can use all the weight balls, bat speed programs, velocity programs that you want. You could get every implement in the world, right, at your disposal. You could know every single cue in the world. You could have every single drill in the world. But if you don't change the pattern, you can't fix the problem. And our job as coaches is to be able to dig into that toolbox of all those different things and figure out how to get that athlete to create a movement adaptation, get that athlete to change how they're moving, okay? As a movement coach, though, before we do that, 
The first thing we have to understand, like if you want to teach a guy to squat better, right? The first thing you have to understand is what are good positions? Why are they good positions? And how can we efficient, how does it, what does it look like to efficiently move through those positions? You can't coach it if you don't know what it looks like. You have to start with the movement. As a hitting coach, it is no different. We have to understand what good positions are and why, and how to efficiently move through those positions. Now, good science, good research, not the kind that gets you know, done a lot of the time, but good science, is based on empirical observation. Somebody in a field of expertise is looking into things and he's observing all these things, and he's wondering to himself, why is this this way? Why is that that way? How come this person does this, but this person does that? And then they test it, and they develop hypotheses, right? That's how good science and research start. So I want to walk you through now some of the observations that, that we made that kind of led us to where we are, okay? Observation one, and hitting at the landing position, right? Elite hitters, the goats, the greatest of all time, they, they land with their pelvis and trunk in, in a pretty neutral position, right? Which means their pelvis and trunk right, or square, right, in front of them. So if I'm hitting this way, they're square to the other batter's box, okay? And they all land with some degree of hinge, right, some hinge at their, at their waist, okay? Uh, so take a look at this slide. We got Trout, Arenado, Stanton, and Cabrera. And you can clearly see at landing, these are all home runs, by the way. These are all still shots from home runs, right? Look how neutral they are at the landing position, okay? Now let's take a look at three other guys. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Willie Mays. Let's cross over some generations. Let's look at the old school. All three of these guys had monster forward moves. Big old forward moves, but look how they landed. These are also all home runs, okay? Now, let's, think, let's listen to what Barry Bonds has to say. I don't know if I can do anything to do this. I have to be in the center. And then I strike. And then I strike. Right there, you, you listen to him talk about landing, centered, right, balanced, and then he strikes. He doesn't try to strike while he's in the air. He specifically and methodically talks about landing square. This was pulled from an interview he did in Japan. And, and Barry was a thinker. Barry really worked on his craft. Like, he worked really hard at being great. And that was something that was really, really important to him. Let's listen to this other one. Because it's like, it's like dodgeball. You get So think about what he said. He said it's like dodgeball, right? And he was thinking about that. He just came up, it sounded like he just came up with that on the spot. In dodgeball, you, you can't commit to move any one direction until you can read which way the ball is going, right? So it's kind of like dodgeball, and you have to be balanced and ready to go, and then you read the ball, and then you make a commitment to the move. That, that's what hitting is. He, he wanted to land before he committed to actually swinging at the pitch, and that's coming from one of the greatest of all time. Now, Varying degrees of hinge at landing. You got everybody from Ken Griffey that, that had some hinge this way, just a tiny bit, all the way to Ricky Henderson, Vlad Guerrero, Rod Carew that had tremendous hinge, right? So varying degrees, but all had some degree of hinge, okay? Now, observation number two. This is a big one, okay? This is a big deal. An astronomically large percentage of the goats either started closed, right? meaning angled, right, stepped closed, or scissored their back foot behind them, okay? Or a combination of any which of those and or all three, which puts them all, every single one of them, at an angled position with their body and impact with the ball. This is, this was big. I mean, this is big, okay? You look at everybody from Ernie Banks, you look at, uh, you know, Miguel Cabrera, Hank Aaron, Mike Trout, uh, Robin Yao, Paul Molitor, Stanton, Gripkin, uh, Chris Bryant, like up and down the line. You look at Ruth, look at his back foot. He starts close, step close, and kicks back, right? Hank Aaron starts close, step close, and kick back. Mays starts even, steps close, and kicks back, okay? Manny Ramirez, Frank Thomas, Mark McGuire, right? Look, look at what, observe what's actually happening right here. 
It's amazing that in my entire life of studying this game passionately, I never saw this before. And then once I saw it for the first time, I couldn't unsee it ever again. I couldn't unsee it ever again. It was almost confusing when I first saw it. Like, how did I not ever see that before? All of our brains think autobiographically through our own lens. We almost train ourselves to see things in the way that we understand them. So it's important to really open up the mind to truly observe what's actually happening and wonder why this is happening. Look at Altuve. Look at McCutcheon. Look at Tatis, Tatis Jr. Right? Like if all of these guys are doing this throughout history, there's got to be some kind of reason why. And it must be something powerful. Look at Trout, look at JD, look at Miggy, right? Like, unbelievable, Griffey, Bonds, Edgar Martinez. Like, and then, interestingly enough, when you look at hitters lower halves, there's another interesting thing that happens, right? Uh, you'll see their back foot, right? After it gets peeled up, you'll see it anchor back and flatten right into impact with the ball. So there are some guys that don't even, like, um, step close. They're even, there's even some hitters that are open. Not as many, much smaller faction, but they're landing open, but that heel boy, those guys, it anchors down big time, okay? Take a look at George Springer, right? See that back foot right into impact. It hardly gets turned, and then it kicks back, and it works back down. So you see a combination there. Now with Votto, you'll see it really just peel up, work right back down, okay? And when you look across the board, man, you got Sammy Sosa, Ricky Anderson, Andre Scalarado, Mike Schmidt, like all of these guys. It's not some of them. When I said astronomically higher percentage, I meant astronomically high percentage, okay? Observation number three, how quickly their pelvis stops. Uh, I don't know who remembers this, but this is an epic moment in baseball history. This is game seven of the World Series. This is Joe Carter. This is the walk-off home run. Every kid's dream. Right? That they practice in their backyard. Look how quickly his pelvis stops. Look at the angle of his pelvis right here. See how quickly that stops? Like, that, that's interesting, right? I mean, I thought that was an interesting observation. Let's take a look at Hank Aaron. Let's take a look at his hips. Look how quickly they stop. And in fact, let's not just look at Hank Aaron. Let's hear from him. Let's hear what he has to say about it. Now, if you have no role in your hip, you can hit the ball to right field with a lot of power. Do you hear what he just said? If you have no roll in your hips, you can hit the ball to right field with a lot of power. Guys, this is like 50 years ago. And Hank Aaron specifically just told you that he did not want his pelvis to roll forward, right? He, he, he didn't want it to roll. He wants it to stay behind. This was an interview. They asked him, how do you hit the ball in the opposite field with so much power, right? This was his response. That's how he does it. He specifically understands what's happening with his body, and he feels like that helps him hit the ball in the opposite field with more power. Interesting. Something we need to research. Willie Mays, Pete Rose, Dave Winfield. Look at the angle of the pelvis. His hips haven't even, like, turned. Look at Rose and BP. Look how quickly that pelvis stops. Look at Mays. Look how quickly it stops. Look at that angle from the pelvis. Right? Let's look at Manny. Let's look at Frank Thomas. Let's look at McGuire. Same thing. You look at the same videos and see the same thing. Manny Ramirez. Uh, you, know, you got Altuve. You got Betts. You got Tatis. Right? You got Trout. You got JD. You got Mitty. All the same. Observation number four, okay? How quickly their trunk stops. I want you to take a look at, at Brian. Think about how fast, these are both also uh, home runs, by the way. Uh, th think about how fast this motion takes place. And think about how still all of that body is. The only thing moving, there becomes a point in time where the barrel and the arms are the only thing moving. Everything else has come to a direct and complete halt, okay? This ball that Barry Bonds hit, like this is one you can find on YouTube. This guy hit this into the roof. I think it was at the Tokyo Dome and, and some uh, live VP. Like there was almost no rotation there. Look how quickly everything stopped. Take a look at Altuve. Take a look right here. Look at it, just completely. Look at the whole body, just stable, 
right? Nothing happened. Now, while we've seen these things and a lot of the greatest of all time, I think it's important when you're doing research to explore uh, as many other avenues as you possibly can. So let's look at some similar activities that require rotation, force production, and striking an object. Start with golf, right? This is one of the long drive champions of the world right here on the left. We're seeing a lot of similarities, especially to how him and, and J.D. Martinez move, but we, we really don't see those, that, that pelvis rotating a whole lot here. We see that back foot start to slide a little behind. It's not really rotating a tremendous amount. Take a look at Tiger Woods, right? He's the goat, right? Take a look at his back foot. Oh, look, it just stops and holds and holds and holds all the way through the rest of that swing, right? Now let's take a look at uh, Roy McIlroy, right? Roy McIlroy is like 5'8". This dude hits the ball like 400 yards, right? Like, what is he doing? Well, looks like the same thing. That's all the way through extension in the swing, and his back foot holds on. Here's Tony Finau, right? Finau is a notably short backswing, right? But hits the ball pretty good. His back heel doesn't even come off the ground one inch all the way through extension to that point. Not one inch, okay? Now, here's Mike Trout. Mike Trout golfing. I don't know if anybody saw that uh, video going around last year of him hitting balls out of the, out of the uh, what's it called, the, the golfing facility. Um, just hitting absolute bombs. And oh look, he does the same thing here. He does the same thing here. Now let's, let's move the needle. How about chopping wood, right? Chopping wood, we're, we're swinging an ax, we're striking an object, we're trying to transmit force into the object. Look at those feet, they hardly rotate. Everything stops at impact, right? Different activity, a lot of similar things, interesting to look at. Now let's take a look at the weight room. Put somebody on a cable machine, or this happens to be a versa wheel, a versa pulley, which is a flywheel. Uh, they're amazing, by the way. Probably the best piece, single best piece of training equipment you can get for baseball players. Um, but let's look how he's moving. He's trying to move a large amount of weight, and gosh, I mean, that's really hard for him. And there's very little rotation down low, right? It's interesting, right? Now, how about little kids? I think one of the best things we can all do is look at little kids. Look at true self-organization, right? Kids that are really just uh, learning how to move uh, in a natural way, how God kind of uh, made them and intended. Well, this is my uh, eight-year-old daughter, uh, who is now nine, and we're, we're throwing a med ball into the wall as hard as she can with a shuffle. And even with all those running steps forward, look how she lands. She lands square, right? Upper body goes forward, back leg works behind a little bit and kind of kind of actually counter-rotates almost after she releases. That's interesting. How about we take a look at that? This is a, a water-filled ball. It's about 10 pounds of water. Same exercise. She's throwing as hard as she can. This one is harder. It has more instability. Look how right after she gets rid of it, she's like pushing back. And if you look closer to the pelvis, it's like working the other direction. So that's interesting, right? Lots of similarities here. Now, how about we look at little kids hitting? Now, this is a really interesting situation because this particular little kid, this is his first time ever in life swinging at a moving ball. This is one of my best friends. Uh, he runs Baseball Cloud, Kevin Davidson, which you guys should look into. Um, this is his son, right? And he's, I think, four years old at the time, four or five, something like that. Um, this was a couple of years ago. And if you notice, first time ever swinging against the moving ball, he kicks back and, oh, look at that. Look at the counter rotation of the pelvis right after, right after he hits it. Really interesting, right? Interesting stuff. Now let's take a look at this kid. This one's great, right? Because look at the dad. He's looking at this ball like, holy cow, son, you're going to the big leagues. How'd you just do that? Interesting movement right here, right? Little kid, probably had no lessons, right? He's probably like five years old. Well, strides, and what does he do right through impact? Well, he kicks back. And he stops, his, his pelvis stops, and gosh, I think for his size and age, like, that's eh, pretty good. He put a lot of force into that ball. Okay, now let's look at the next one.
So here's the amazing thing about this video, right? So I, I shot this myself. This was at our local Little League. It was like two years ago. My girls were seven. Uh, we're playing seven U machine pitch. And this team was absolutely raking. Like they were absolutely crushing us. And I went to talk to the coaches even after the game, and they were just dads. None of them have ever even coached their kids before. And we still see all these amazing same movements showing up. Now, the interesting thing you might be wondering now is like, well, how come more of my players at the college level or the high school level or whatever uh, don't look like that, even the professional level? How come more guys don't do that when they hit? And the, here's a really interesting thing. The, the most biomechanically similar in a lab, the data, the most bio, biomechanically similar movements uh, to a big leaguer, to the elites, to the best of all time, are little kids. Little kids, right, that move naturally, okay? So, with all of this, fascinating, right? Really interesting, maybe seen some things you've never seen before, heard some things you've never heard before, but what does it even mean? What does it even mean, and how can this information help you do a better job in player development? We're gonna get to that in the next presentation.